Now that we are done covering the recreational stimulants, we will now move to the opposite category, the recreational depressants. Depressants are the yin to the stimulant's yang, activating the parasympathetic nervous system and causing feelings of relaxation and sedation, rather than the manic energy bursts of stimulants. We'll go over three main classes of recreational depressants, alcohol, benzodiazepines, and opiates. In addition, we'll briefly cover how to treat issues like addiction and overdose related to each drug class. We'll start with alcohol, the second most commonly used psychotropic substance in the world, just after caffeine. One-third of the world's population consumes alcohol on a regular basis, whether in the form of beer, wine, mixed drink, or liquors. Alcohol acts primarily by altering the lipid bilayer surrounding the GABA receptor, which changes its conformation and enhances GABA transmission. In addition, alcohol interacts with serotonin, dopamine, all three glutamate receptors, and various ion channels. However, all you really need to know at this level is that it works primarily on GABA. The fact that alcohol is legal in the United States and many other countries does not mean that it is somehow more benign than illicit drugs. In fact, on the scale of all psychoactive substances, alcohol is among the highest in terms of lethality, and moderately high for dependence and abuse potential. This serves to underscore the point that legality does not equal safety, and vice versa. This chart, put out by the World Health Organization, should really drive the point home. Unlike the previous chart, this one shows actual harm done by each drug, taking into account the number of people using them. Given the widespread use of alcohol, it gets the number one spot by a mile, surpassing even heroin and crack cocaine, although on a per head basis it's definitely less harmful than those drugs. Alcohol intoxication is graded by blood alcohol content. Initially users will experience some mild euphoria and relaxation. As intoxication increases, the depressant effect of alcohol becomes clear, and users become increasingly sedated with slurred speech, delayed responses and reaction times, ataxic walking and movements, and emotional lability. With further intoxication, users become confused, disoriented, and experience the classic room spinning with subsequent nausea and vomiting. Past the blood alcohol content of 0.3, severe stupor, unconsciousness, respiratory depression, and potentially even death can occur. Following the first rule of neurotransmission, what goes up must come down, or in this case, what goes down must come back up. Rebounding from a depressed state, users experience a feeling of anxiety and activation, with many finding it difficult to sleep. In more severe cases, patients can develop seizures and vital sign instability, owing to overactivation of the sympathetic nervous system. This can lead to significant morbidity and mortality, and before the advent of modern medicine, patients in severe alcohol withdrawal had a 35% chance of dying. Two quick clinical pearls related to alcohol. First, alcohol causes liver damage, and this can be recognized by a greater increase than AST than ALT. You can remember this by thinking of AST in the letters in the word wasted. Second, long-term alcohol use can cause a deficiency of thiamine, or vitamin B1. You can remember this association by thinking of a drunk man slurring the phrase, I'm sorry, thiamine a drunken stupor. If you make the I into a 1, you can remember that thiamine is vitamin B1 as well. Because of the significant morbidity and mortality associated with it, let's spend a few more moments going over alcohol withdrawal in more detail. Remember that, as stated before, withdrawal from a depressant such as alcohol is much worse from a clinical standpoint than withdrawal from a stimulant. There are some clinical diagnoses that are associated with alcohol withdrawal that we need to go over. The most feared complication of alcohol withdrawal is delirium tremens, also known as DTs. Delirium tremens typically occurs in patients with a long history of chronic alcoholism and, even with medical treatment, is associated with a 5-15% to risk of death, often due to status epilepticus and or cardiovascular collapse. About 2-3 to three days after the last drink, patients with DTs experience significant shaking of the body, hallucinations, extreme vital sign instability, and seizures. You need to be able to recognize this clinical picture as it requires a prompt response. You can remember this using the mnemonic DTs are hell. D for delirium, or the significant confusion and agitation that accompanies DTs. T for tremor. S for sympathetic overactivation, resulting in fever, hypertension, tachycardia, and tachypnea. H for hallucinations, primarily visual. E for elevated ESR. L for leukocytosis. And the second L for LFTs. Use this mnemonic to rapidly recognize the clinical picture, as these patients need to be in the ICU for closer monitoring. You should be assessing for DTs on a daily basis while taking care of any patient detoxing from alcohol. The treatment for DTs, and for severe alcohol withdrawal in general, is benzodiazepines. 
While it is seemingly counterintuitive to treat GABA withdrawal by giving a drug that activates GABA even more, the use of a controlled taper allows for a slower, safer return to baseline, rather than the erratic and extreme swings in physiology seen in unopposed withdrawal. You can see that in this graph, where the blue line shows what happens in unopposed alcohol withdrawal, whereas the green line shows a steady, more controlled return to baseline seen with benzodiazepine treatment. The secret of successful treatment is to give as many benzodiazepines as it takes to suppress symptoms in the first 24 hours, then taper off by about 10-20% to 20% each day. One last note on alcohol withdrawal. There is another clinical syndrome, known as alcoholic hallucinosis, that is easily confused for delirium tremens, as both occur during alcohol withdrawal, and both are characterized by an altered sensorium. However, it's important to distinguish between the two, as alcoholic hallucinosis is much more benign than DTs. The key feature is that alcoholic hallucinosis has no vital sign instability, making it much safer than DTs. Make sure you know how to distinguish between these two syndromes. Given the high addictive potential of alcohol, as well as its effect not only on an individual's health, but also on the public's health from such activities as drunk driving, we must briefly discuss the pharmacologic treatment strategies for alcohol abuse and dependence. The first drug used to treat alcohol dependence is a camprosate, brand name Camprol. A camprosate is like alcohol in that it agonizes GABA and antagonizes glutamate, but it does so in a much gentler way allowing those with neuronal degeneration from chronic alcohol abuse to live more easily without alcohol. The benefits are only modest, however, and most data seem to indicate that long-term outcomes are not necessarily different between those receiving a camprosate and those in normal support groups. For this drug, just know that it is used to treat those suffering from alcohol addiction. I try to remember this association by thinking of someone getting far away from the temptations of alcohol by going camping and trying to live off the land for a bit. Go camping with a camprosate. The next drug, disulfiram, brand name Antibuse, is a bit more high yield than acamprosate and gets tested more often. Disulfiram uses the psychological principle of positive punishment to decrease drinking behavior. Let's go over the mechanism in some more detail. First, when you drink alcohol, the ethanol gets converted in your body to acetaldehyde. On its own, acetaldehyde is toxic to the body, causing nausea, vomiting, flushing of the skin, tachycardia, shortness of breath, and generally feeling ill. However, under normal conditions, nearly all of the acetaldehyde is quickly converted to acetate by the enzyme acetaldehyde dehydrogenase. Acetate is much more easily excreted by the body and does not produce any of the effects that acetaldehyde does, leaving you able to enjoy your drink in peace. However, what disulfiram does is to block the second step in this process by inhibiting acetaldehyde dehydrogenase. This causes the ethanol to be converted entirely to acetaldehyde, rather than acetate, leading to a rapid increase in acetaldehyde, which, as you'll remember, leads to uncomfortable symptoms such as vomiting and headache. If you felt that way whenever you drank, you would probably give up alcohol very quickly, although honestly many patients just end up stopping disulfiram and staying on the alcohol, so it really requires a very motivated person to comply with this type of treatment. One high-yield tidbit is that metronidazole, an antibiotic used to treat C. diff and other infections, has a similar effect to disulfiram when taken with alcohol. Obviously, this is something you'll want to counsel patients on so they know to avoid alcohol while on metronidazole and for about 48 hours after completing treatment. I remember this association by thinking of a drunk guy on a metro subway to remember the link between drinking and metronidazole. There are other modalities for treating alcohol dependence. The most famous of these is AA, or Alcoholics Anonymous, which uses peer support and boundary setting to encourage abstinence from alcohol. While AA is the most famous, there are many other psychological treatments for alcohol dependence, including the psychotherapy CBT. The efficacy of these therapies is controversial, but research seems to indicate that most successful outcomes occur when the treatments are matched to patient preferences, so it's worth discussing all of the options available to see if there are any that the patient prefers. We already covered benzodiazepines under the anxiolytic section, but it's worth taking a moment to consider that benzos, and barbiturates as well, have no less of an abuse potential just because you can prescribe them. Indeed, benzodiazepines are among the most frequently abused drugs of any kind, prescription or not. Mechanistically, when you prescribe someone benzos, you're basically prescribing them alcohol with a somewhat cleaner pharmacologic profile, so please weigh the risks and benefits before starting a patient on them. Remember from our previous discussion that the effects of benzodiazepine intoxication are all about relaxing. The central nervous system shuts down and muscles unclench. Like alcohol, marked ataxia can occur. One feature of benzodiazepine intoxication that is easily abused is its propensity to cause amnesia. In fact, the date rape drug known as Rohypnol or Rufis, which is slipped into drinks with the purpose of causing the victim to forget the details of the event, 
is actually a benzodiazepine, albeit one that is not approved for medical use in the United States. The clinical picture of benzodiazepine withdrawal is everything you would expect, knowing that withdrawal often produces the opposite effect of intoxication. It is characterized by increased cognitive awareness, anxiety, and panic attacks. Physiologically, sleep becomes more difficult, and vital signs often resemble the effects of the sympathetic nervous system, such as tachycardia and tachypnea. In severe cases, seizures can develop, requiring ICU care. While not as deadly as alcohol withdrawal, withdrawal from benzodiazepines is still a serious event and requires close monitoring. Similarly to alcohol, the treatment for benzodiazepine withdrawal is a controlled benzodiazepine taper to allow for a safe return to baseline. Benzodiazepine overdose, while not as uniformly fatal as barbiturate overdose, is still a dangerous situation, so knowing how to handle it in an emergency setting is important. For patients who have overdosed on benzodiazepines, there is a treatment available which antagonizes GABA. Known as flumazenil, brand name Anexate, it is indicated for acute benzodiazepine toxicity. You can remember that flumazenil is related to benzos by the aza in its name, and you can also remember that it is an antagonist by thinking of the nil at the end of the name. Nil means nothing, so flumazenil turns benzos into nothing. The last general category of recreational depressants we will cover are the opiates, which, like benzodiazepines, are dually categorized as both prescription drugs as well as recreational drugs. While our discussion will mostly focus on diacetyl morphine, more famously known as heroin, Keep in mind that what we are discussing applies largely to prescription opiates like morphine as well. Diacetylmorphine, or heroin, is your classic opiate narcotic. Heroin has the same binding affinity for the opioid receptor that prescription drugs such as morphine do, and indeed some European countries allow prescription heroin and even prefer it to morphine due to its lesser side effect profile. Compared with other opiates, heroin and morphine seem to be the most capable of inducing a feeling of euphoria, which makes them especially prone to abuse even though their analgesic effects are on the lower side compared with fentanyl or Dilaudid. The intoxication picture for heroin is straight out of the armed Chinese man mnemonic. Analgesia, respiratory depression, meiosis, euphoria, drowsiness, and constipation. Meiosis, or pinpoint pupils, is a particularly high-yield sign to note, but you should know this whole slide cold. In terms of withdrawal, heroin is your classic cold turkey situation. Pilo erection, as pictured here, is fairly specific for heroin withdrawal in the context of drug use. Two other famous side effects, diarrhea and dilated pupils, should make sense, as they are the opposite of the constipation and pupillary constriction seen in heroin intoxication. A quick note for boards, black tar heroin, a form of cheaply produced heroin traded by Mexican cartels, has an association with botulism that you should know. As far as boards are concerned, just think black tar heroin equals botulism. Finally, we will cover the treatment strategies used for opiate detoxification and treatment of opiate overdose. Like Suboxone for stimulants and Flumazenil for benzos, medications exist to help reverse the effects of these drugs. Two exist for opiates, Naloxone and Naltrexone. Both of these work as competitive antagonists at opioid receptors, but differ primarily in terms of half-life. Naloxone has a quick half-life and is used for acute management of opiate overdose, whereas naltrexone has a longer half-life and is used on an outpatient basis for chronic dependence treatment. I remember the uses of naloxone and naltrexone by thinking of naloxone and naltrexone. These two drugs are the nail in the coffin of opiate dependence. To differentiate between the two, I focus on naloxone and naltrexone. Like pair oxetine, I think of a fast oxin, which reminds me of the fast half-life of naloxone and using it in a more acute sense. On the other hand, when thinking of naltrexone, I think of a long trek, which reflects the reality that treating opiate dependence is a long journey, which is where naltrexone comes in. Just as a quick review from the section on analgesics, methadone, buprenorphine, and butorphanol, all of which are agonists or partial agonists at the opioid receptor, are also used to treat opiate dependence in the United States. Feel free to watch the lecture on analgesics again for further review. Okay, almost done. Take a break for now.